Welcome back everybody to Medical Engineering. Today I want to take the opportunity to start looking into the technique of computed tomography. So the idea here is that we can use x-rays to create shadow images of the patient and we've already seen that this essentially are sums along the ray and now we want to reconstruct the virtual slice images like virtually chopping the patient into slices and then look inside the patient such that we can improve diagnosis so looking forward to exploring computed tomography with you guys So computed tomography is a technique that is rather modern. So it has been implemented first in the 70s. And since I think 74, it is really a technology that then went on to the clinic. But actually the history is much longer. And I want to show to you also the mathematical principles behind this. So we've already seen that for the imaging itself, we very heavily relied in MRI imaging on the Fourier transform, which is about 250 years old. And the theory for forming the images from computer tomography was actually only discovered in 1917. So you see that the technology in terms of math is only about 100 years old. So let's see what I have for you. So we start with the motivation and the brief history. Now, the computed tomography approach is one of the most important technologies in medical imaging because it allows us to look inside the body and really spatially resolve parts of the inner organs and so on. We can also use contrast agents such that we can also make specific structures better visible. And it is the first volumetric modality that has been discovered over the history. We already talked about MR, so this point is not entirely true, but we are essentially following the mathematical development here. So in other courses about medical engineering, you probably talk first about CT and then about MRI, but I found it much more intuitive to start with MRI because the mathematical principles of imaging, they are much older. And therefore we will need some of them when we want to understand the principles of CT. And you will see that actually in this and the next videos, why we already need the knowledge about the Fourier transform in order to understand what's happening here in CT. Now CT is a really great modality to image heart tissues like the head bone or the spine and it is the first modality that was able to look inside the skull and on the left hand side you see a modern image a reconstruction that shows very nicely the bones and this is actually a volume rendering on the right hand side you see the first ct image that has ever been created in a clinical environment and you see that this is a very interesting image because you can now look inside of the head and this image is actually 80 by 80 pixels yeah, so you have 80 pixels here and 80 pixels here so it's a rather low resolution image but it shows us the x-ray absorption coefficients at every point inside of the head and we can look inside of the head without actually to having it cut open imagine you would cut through the skull at this point that would be a pretty invasive kind of surgery and now we can look inside the head and discover things and what's really exciting here is you see there's a lot of artifact yeah? so you see that the skull here has these white shadows that appear so they're actually not really present but what's much more exciting about this image is the position here so you can see this dark shadow so there is some area in the brain that has a very different contrast than the surrounding tissue. And here you can see that this is actually able to diagnose the cause 
of certain disease and we don't have to open the skull and we can figure out things about the patient before we actually have to do an intervention. And it also contributed a lot to understanding the brain structures and the neuroanatomy in the early days. So really a wonderful technology and of course people got very excited about the kind of images that have been generated here and this is also one of the reasons why CT imaging has been awarded a Nobel Prize. Now, let's think about what we can do with that. So typically x-rays are used to acquire 2D projection images. And in the 2D projection image, everything is superimposed. So everything along the ray is just projected into a single pixel. So we only see shadows of the imaged object, but we would like to look inside. And I have an example here. And this example shows a couple of images. And one thing that you can do, for example, is here on the left hand side, you see the X-ray projection and it's very difficult to actually discover anything. And what you can now do is you can essentially cut planes through our object here. So you can actually cut a plane and then look at this plane. And then you can discover, for example, that there is a very thin bag here and you can even read some of the letters that have been presented here. So you can make things visible that have not been visible before. Or you can also see in the second example here. So this is this is object number two. Object number two is this guy here. You can barely recognize it. If you have a volume rendering, it looks like this. And now you can see if I choose the slices appropriately through different through different regions here. So you could probably think that the green one is slicing in this direction, right? So this is a slice along here. And then you have the blue and the, so let's say the blue could be, for example, a slice that runs here through the object. And then there is still the red one. So the red one could be a slice that runs like this through the object. So this would be the red plane and this would be the blue plane. So you can fully volumetrically discover the object and while on image A it may be hard to actually figure out what is shown, then you see here when I slice through this object you can see this is a kind of fruit and it's probably an apple. So this way we can understand what's happening inside of the object and of course you recognize images like this one because this very much looks like an apple when you cut it through. So we know how to cut apples and we've seen cut apples and this way we don't even have to touch the apple. So we just have it here inside of a bag or inside of a box and we can still uncover the contents of the box. So that's a really exciting and cool technology and with this we can now use this for diagnosis. Let's shortly discuss the history of CT. And you see it goes back all the way 
1917 because in that year Johann Radon discovered the mathematical principles how to invert the line integrals. So this is a paper actually published in German language and this paper here actually has not been used for 50 years. Only in 1971 the first CT scanner was actually built that then used essentially those principles in order to construct slice images and the inventors and creators of CT were Godfrey Hounsfield and Alan Cormack and both of them then later on went on to win the Nobel Prize. So this was awarded in 1979 and the next breakthrough you could say that was determined here is in 1919 and this is the spiral or rubber helico CT acquisition that was actually discovered by Professor Willy Kalender and Willy Kalender is a professor of FAU so he was teaching at our institute he retired a couple of years ago but he is the inventor of the helical CT and helical CT was the breakthrough technology that essentially got rid of the problem that you have to determine certain slices but with helical CT you can really acquire continuously entire volumes. So really cool technologies and you see that in the early days of CT you had like four minutes per rotation, you had reconstructions of 80 times 80 pixels and three bit depth and the reconstruction took several hours. Now in 2002 already you had 0.4 seconds per rotation. So we actually have to rotate about the object in order to acquire the image. And we could reconstruct 16 slices in parallel in 512 times 512 pixels at 16 bits depth resolution. So this could be reconstructed already on the fly. There have been some further improvements in 2005. The first dual source CTs emerged and this is a CT gantry that has two sources and two detectors and with this we can acquire multiple energies at the same time. So you remember when we discussed x-rays that we have different x-ray energies and different spectra. If I measure two of the energies then I can also start thinking about material decomposition and really create quantitative numbers from the scanning. Then there were also multiple slice field of view scanners with a field of view of up to 16 centimeters that can be acquired in a single spin. This is also quite a bit of a breakthrough and in 2014 up to 128 slices in parallel at a temporal resolution of approximately 200 milliseconds could be determined with a single source. If you use it on a dual source system you can even double this acquisition speed such that in the dual source scanners because you have two sources and two detectors you can actually acquire at a much faster rate and you get below 100 milliseconds in terms of acquisition time today. So this is enough to create volumetric movies of the heart. And in contrast to bind techniques that then rely on a cyclic or periodic heart motion, this kind of technology can also be used to image asynchronous movement, so non-periodic heartbeats. And obviously if you, the heart is sick, it might happen that it's not moving in a way that you would expect it. So it could have some non-periodic motion and this can all be acquired in a single go on a modern day CT scanner. So there's really cool CT scanners out there that allow to do so. And here is one image of such a CT scanner. Now in this scanner you can see that you actually have a gantry. So the this is the gantry. So the source and the detector are moving here about the patient. So we need to rotate about the patient to generate the x-ray image. And here you can see that this kind of scanner also allows a tilt. So you see that the entire gantry can be moved back and this is now at an angle to the floor. So it doesn't stand upright but it can be moved down and the idea behind that is that you scan the patient at a different angle and this is particularly interesting if the patient face is pointing towards the top you can scan the entire brain with these kind of 
tilted slices without having to scan through the eyes and that's very efficient in terms of those. So this is a reason why you can actually tilt those gantries in order to avoid scanning through organs that are very sensitive to those like the eye. So this is one modern day scanner and obviously the scanners are now also much more dose efficient. Image quality has improved a lot and it's also quite interesting to see an open view of such a scanner because they rotate very very quickly in modern day scanners up to four times per second a complete rotation. So this is really a technology that allows us to scan very quickly high resolution if you want to scan a full body so from head to toe you can do that on such a machine in approximately 10 seconds. So here you also need fast patient beds in order to be able to move the patient through the scanner quickly enough. So this is typically then also used in emergency situations where you only want to spend very little time on the diagnostics and the acquisition. And of course, this is also very useful if you have motion, breathing and so on, then the scan can be performed very quickly. It's still a really important technology in the clinic. Now we want to try to understand the mathematical principles behind that and a key principle is the Radon transform that was discovered in 1917 and the so-called Fourier slice theorem because this is the main principle that allows us to build fast reconstruction algorithms today. So what will we cover? Well the Radon transform is essentially the acquisition. So it's the mathematical principle of how the image is acquired and it's an equation that builds on line integrals and we've already seen that the x-rays are nothing else than acquiring sums along the rays, so they are line integrals. Now the inverse Radon transform allows us to reconstruct from the projection images the original slice images or the patient information. The Fourier slice theorem is a key result that has been identified by Radon, which allows us to reconstruct very quickly. And we will try to demonstrate all of this mainly in a visual manner. So we'll use some equations, but now if you understood what the Fourier transform, what the 2D Fourier transform is, then you should be able to follow these ideas without having to go through all the equations. Obviously, we also have all the equations in the textbook. So if you want to understand the math in a more detailed fashion, then you can also go back to the textbook. So what we then want to cover in actually the next video is the core idea of the important reconstruction algorithms. So today's video will mainly look into the mathematics and the guiding principles how we can actually reconstruct images. So we've seen in the previous video what we actually can observe on our detector and source is this relation that i equals to the original intensity times this e to the minus the integral and this is essentially f of let's say x along the direction of x so this is the ray penetrating the object remember this guy so this was our patient this is our source and this is the detector. So you see that this is the detector, then this is the source, and what we are actually interested in is our patient. So the, our patient is already anonymized, right? This is our patient, he's called f of x. Now we want to solve this, 
and we can do that really quickly because we can simply take this equation and rearrange it such that we divide by i naught so i divided by i zero or i naught then we take the natural logarithm and minus and then we see that the only thing that remains here is this integral over f of x along the ray dx yeah so this is this is x in my example here this is x so this is a 1d coordinate system where this is x and our patient is f of x now this only describes a single ray so that's that's stupid so let's rewrite this and we are now using the integral above so we are changing the notation so p is now the projection this is the solved line integral what we had as the integral over f of x dx on the previous one uh, so this is our p of l and you see now that i'm using l and l is the line and now we want to have multiple lines so we essentially determine this line as a line running through a 2d space and now this 2d space has components x and y and we change the notation yeah? so maybe we should call this x prime or something like this let's call it x prime if this is x prime then we could also have an arbitrary ray running through here and this would be x prime and now at every point along this line we integrate we integrate along this line and obviously now our f of x is this entire slice here and maybe this is the slice that we want to reconstruct right so what we do is we now essentially have to access a 2d function and we have to access the 2d function at the points where we are actually intersecting so we need more of them right we want to intersect everything here everything along this line so in this direction it's just a 1d integral so you could say if i compute the integral along this x dash or x prime then we're in this formulation here but instead i can also say okay i integrate over this entire plane here i integrate over the entire green section here and now i have to rewrite this because this is the 1d integral so this is the purple element here so i'm integrating along the line but obviously i have to figure out where i'm actually in this 2d image so i'm only accessing the red points here so these were the red points and these are the coordinates of the red points here and i do that for all elements that are essentially on this line obviously i can also rewrite this i can essentially integrate over the entire domain here i can integrate in a double integral over this entire section and then i just say okay i will add everything up but i'm only doing it at the position where the line actually is and this is an alternative formulation that we will find extremely useful so we will see that now here this is a double integration so this is an integration from minus to plus infinity along dx dy so you see this is our dx dy plane and now we add a delta function and the delta function is a function that is zero everywhere except at zero and if you look very closely here this is exactly our line this is the line here and if the condition x times cosine theta plus y sine theta minus s equals to zero right then we are exactly on this line and when we are on this line the delta function will exactly be so delta function is gonna be zero if we are not on the line and it's gonna be one for the line so if you're on the line it's gonna be one and everywhere else it's going to be zero and now you can already see if i do this mathematical trick 
what then happens is that although I'm summing over this entire plane here, I'm multiplying with zero everywhere except for all the points on this line. And you see also that this line equation here, this x cosine theta plus y sine theta equals to s, shows up exactly here in this argument because it's simply subtracting x. Yeah? So this is an equal zero condition. So if I subtract s here, I get exactly the condition that we have here. So now you can understand this equation that it is essentially a kind of a less efficient implementation how to compute this line integral because effectively it only computes the sum over all the elements of the line but I'm actually iterating with a double for loop over the entire plane. Typically you don't want to implement the line integrals like this in code because you have essentially a complexity of n square if this is n but integrating only along this line here would give us a complexity of only n. Still, mathematically, both formulations are exactly equivalent. So why do we do this? Well, we can see now that if we rotate 180 degrees all around the object, we get all the set of line integrals. So you can imagine this in the following way. If you actually start acquiring an object, and the object is of course in the center of rotation, and now I start acquiring here, I'm collecting all of those line integrals here. Then I rotate, let's say, by 90 degrees. Then I'm gathering all the line integrals here. And at 180 degrees, my detector is here. And I start just collecting exactly the same line integrals again, but just in the opposite direction. So you can see now that the 180 degree and the zero degree projection are exactly the same, except that they're flipped. So I'm not creating any new knowledge by rotating more than 180 degrees, which is the reason why we only define our rotation angle between 0 and 180 degrees. And obviously we have to integrate over the entire line from minus to plus infinity. And we assume also that our objects are on a compact set, which means that in practice our object only lives in a space somewhere inside of our coordinate system and this way we can omit the integration from plus to minus infinity because we only need to know the bounds of the object and then we only integrate within the object. So this is the key idea that we want to do and the reconstruction problem is now given all of the projections, given all of these guys, how can I get back to this kind of object here. That's the key problem of image reconstruction. We can write this up a little more formally or use an example because this leads to the so-called sinogram. So the sinogram is the sequence of all projections. You see that our f of x, this lives in this 2D space and now we can convert this into a different domain. So we convert this into a different domain and this is now also a 2D space, but it is the 2D space in S and in theta, because these are all the projections, right? All the projections that I gathered, so all of those guys here. They now become lines in this two-dimensional space, and the rotation direction is actually the second direction here. So this is this guy here. And this is called a sinogram. And it's mainly called a sinogram because if you have an object here, it will be projected onto a sinusoidal wave. So if you think about 
rotating about this point and thinking where the circle will be projected to, then you can figure out that it will start moving on sinusoidal waves in this kind of projective space. So this is the sinogram and this sinogram here, that's the key observation by Radon, this sinogram here is enough to describe the entire object. So if we know the sinogram, then we can reconstruct the object. And if we know the object by projection or simulation, you can reconstruct the entire sinogram. So they are both essentially equivalent. And you've already seen this kind of relation with the Fourier transform, right? With the Fourier transform, if we know the 2D Fourier transform, like an MR, we can reconstruct the object. If we know the object, we can reconstruct the 2D Fourier space. So again, this is a kind of transform between, you could say, two basis representations. Yet the projection on line integrals is not really an orthogonal basis like in the Fourier transform case, but it has redundancies. So because the points essentially contribute multiple times to the same observation. So this is something you have to keep in the back of your mind, but this is the transform into the projection space. And now the inverse random transform is the idea how to reconstruct from your projective space back to the image space or volume space. That's the key problem that we want to solve. So this brings us to the so-called Fourier slice theorem. And the Fourier slice theorem now introduces an additional Fourier space here. And you've seen previously that this is the Fourier transform of our object space and our sinogram space. And what the Fourier transform says in this case, it helps us to understand the identity between two relationships. So now I'm introducing a Fourier space for the actual object. So this is a Fourier space of the object. And the let's take a different color. So let's say this is our Fourier space. So this is all Fourier values. And we are transforming using the Fourier transform here. Now what the Fourier Slice theorem tells us is that there is a relation between those two Fourier spaces. There are identities between the Fourier space of the slice image and the Fourier space of the projection image. They are related. And that is the key observation of the Fourier slice theorem that also allows us, first of all, to guarantee completeness of the actual acquisition and it also tells us how we can reconstruct. So the Fourier slice theorem says that if you have a projection at a certain angle theta, so the projection at angle theta, the line that coincides through the center of Fourier space with exact same angle has the identical coefficients. So the 2D and this 1D Fourier space they have coefficients that are absolutely identical. So we can show this in a small image. So we already know above relation. So this is our object space. You remember this guy? This is our sinogram space. And now we introduce the Fourier space here on the right hand side. And now what we're saying is that the Fourier transform of the 1D projection, so the Fourier transform of this guy, so this is a single projection image and I'm taking a 1D Fourier transform, then of course I get a 1D series of coefficients and these, they are identical to the coefficients in a 2D Fourier space along this line and it's the line that runs through the origin here. So we can say, okay, if we would know all 
of the coefficients here, if we could sample everything here, then we would be able to use a 2D inverse Fourier transform to get back to the image. And obviously, if I know the image, then I can use a 2D Fourier transform to go back to the Fourier coefficients. Now, the problem is I do not observe the entire image. Yeah? So I, I don't know this guy here. So I don't know this guy. And the only thing I know are these guys. And now the key idea is that I can essentially do the projection. Then I have the projections. I go to Fourier space. Then I have 1D coefficients. And now I know that all of those 1D coefficients, they run through the center. And now if you see that I rotate by 180 degrees our lines, then I essentially have the star-like figure that samples all of the coefficients in this 2D space. And then I can use an inverse 2D Fourier transform and get back to our image. Sounds a bit complicated, right? Because I have to do the projection, I have to do a 1D Fourier transform, an inverse Fourier transform, and this kind of rebinning here from these lines over the kind of radial transform there. So this is a bit complicated, but it generally allows us to get back to our original image. So that's cool. And Radon showed this in 1917. So this is his main achievement. And if you know this, then you can also design a reconstruction formula. And the reconstruction formula is still known as the Radon inverse. This is a bit difficult to follow, and I want to show you an intuition why this is actually the case. So we remember this figure of the 2D Fourier space. So you know that if I want to get essentially this point here, I need to take the original object image and multiply it with this plane wave here. Right? I take the entire object image. So you remember in our case it was this kind of circle here. So I multiply this point-wise, sum everything up, and then I get this point. And if I want to get this point, I take our 2D object. You remember, it looks like this. I multiply the two images, this plane wave and the object, sum everything up, and write it in here. And if I want to get this point here, I need my 2D image. I multiply it at every point, sum everything up, and I get exactly this coefficient. And the same is also true here. So if I want to get this particular coefficient, then I need to multiply at every point, sum this up, and I get this coefficient. So this is how I would get the 2D Fourier space if I knew the object. Now I don't know the object, so I have to be more clever in order to get it. And the idea that we now have is that we want to use projections. And I have this kind of image, and I hope it helps you understand what's actually happening. When we're computing a parallel projection, what we're actually doing is we are summing all of the coefficients along. So this is our 2D space, right? And then summing all of the coefficients along these rays, right? And if I do so, I get my projection image. Now, if I compute the 1D Fourier transform, what I'm actually doing is I take all these sine waves here, I multiply them point by point. So I overlay essentially my projection image here, and I do a pointwise multiplication and sum everything up. And if I do so, then I get exactly this coefficient here. And if I use a different frequency, now I'm using a slightly higher frequency, and now I overlay the projection image, multiply them pointwise, and this will give me exactly this coefficient. And now I take a very high frequency, like this one, and I overlay the projection image, do a pointwise multiplication, sum everything up, and I get exactly this point here. So this is the path that allows us 
to determine the individual Fourier coefficients along our line here. So this is the Fourier space and we have just found all of the coefficients along this particular line here. So this is the line that came from the projections and it has exactly the same angle theta as you would have. So if I take the angle here, this is also going to be theta. So you see that this is one path to compute those coefficients. Now, obviously, I could also take the path of the 2D Fourier transform. And here, you remember, I need those plane waves. And all of those plane waves, they have the same angle, right? So they all have the same orientation. The only thing that changes is the distance between the hills and the valleys, right? So it's just a different frequency in the direction that is perpendicular to the projection direction. So you can see if I look at those plane waves here, what they're actually computing is they compute an integration along this path and a Fourier transform along this path. Yeah, this is what's happening with this plane wave. It computes a, a Fourier transform in the one direction and an integration in the other direction. And you can see that very nicely here that we essentially, if you overlay the projection operation, you see that everything is simply summed up along this direction because in the very end, we sum up over everything in this plane, right? And if I follow this direction, you see I have a kind of sinusoid in the one direction and I have a kind of integration into the other direction. You see, this is the sinusoidal wave. So that's pretty nice because now I have essentially discovered that I have two different paths that compute exactly the same coefficients. So I have the paths with the 2D Fourier transform that exactly determine those coefficients. And I have the path with the 1D Fourier transform that exactly determines the same coefficients. So I hope this helps you to understand why this Fourier slice theorem actually holds. And this is a graphical representation of the Fourier slice theorem. Very well. So this is how you can compute the Fourier slice theorem and how you can link the Fourier space of the projected image and the Fourier space of the actual slice image with each other. That's the key discovery and this tells us that from all of the projection images we are able to reconstruct the actual image. Now what I didn't tell you so far is actually how to compute the reconstructed image. I just showed you the path there and there's actually a couple of methods that allow to do so and we will discuss them in the next video. So now you've understood that the data that we are acquiring is sufficient and in the next video you will understand how to actually design an algorithm that solves this system of linear equations very efficiently. So I hope you enjoyed this video and found it kind of instructive and I'm very much looking forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye bye.